Welcome everyone. Good to see all of you. Welcome to the Alrich Virtual Spring Series. And thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Leslie Brothers, Director of the Alrich Museum of Art. And I'm here with my colleagues, Janet Gerwin, Jana Irwin, Head of Education, Ksenia Gerstein, Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art, And we hope that some of you have had a chance or many of you have had a chance to view the exhibitions at the museum already. If you haven't, please come to see us. We're presenting four exhibitions in the museum currently. The 23rd Faculty Biennial, it's all part of the process. Sharing Matrilineal Memories at WSU the fourth exhibition in our Solving for X series, and two exhibitions, Gordon Park's I Too Am America and Renee Stout Ghosts that are part of a citywide partnership with the Wichita Art Museum, the Kansas African American Museum and Arts Partners, all celebrating African American art in the 20th and 21st century. We're also contributing to this partnership, seven dedicated programs within our Ulrich virtual series. And the second is this evening with artist Doug Barrett. Information on additional programming and much more can be found on our website, ulrich.wichita.edu. Please go to our programs page and register to participate in your selected events. It's easy and it's free. The museum's exhibitions and programs are funded in part by the members of the Salon Circle. I know many of you are out there. Thank you. Thank you for your support. The Kansas Creative Arts Industries Commission through the National Endowment for the Arts, Humanities Kansas, and the city of Wichita. And we're grateful to all of these organizations for supporting the museum, its exhibitions and programs. So it's now my pleasure to pass the screen to Ksenia, who will introduce our fabulous speaker this evening. Thank you. Thanks so much, Leslie. Um, hi, everyone out there in the ether. We're very happy to have you with us tonight. And I'm very happy to welcome tonight photographer Doug Barrett, uh, with whom I personally recently had the pleasure to work on a video that we produced for one of our, one of our current exhibitions, Gordon Park's I Too Am America. Doug is a documentary photographer, journalist, and videographer whose work has a clear kinship with Gordon Parks' career-long dedication to both exposing social injustices and narrating the stories of ordinary people in empathetic and compelling ways, which is why it made so much sense for us to invite Doug to speak about his work um, in conjunction with our current Gordon Parks exhibition. In the last several years, Doug has been using his camera to document homelessness among military veterans across the United States, to capture the African-American communities in Nicodemus, Kansas and Manhattan, Kansas, where Doug lives, and to tell the story of peaceful protests for racial justice that took place in the summer of 2020. Um, Doug is the owner of 400 North Creative in Manhattan, Kansas, and he holds a BS from St. Augustine University and a master's degree from Southwestern College. His photographs have been published in a roster of publications you're all going to know about, including Bloomberg News, Time Magazine, Smithsonian Magazine, Washington Post, New Territory, The Point Magazine, and featured on the NASDAQ billboard in Times Square, in Vice, Fox News, and BBC World News. Doug also has a significant presence and following on social media, particularly Instagram. So if you are fascinated by his work tonight, there are ample opportunities to follow it into the future. And next year, the Mariana Kistler Beach Museum at Kansas State University 
will host Doug's solo exhibition titled Doug Barrett, Find Your Voice. I'm very excited that tonight, all of us will get a sort of sneak peek uh, and Doug's personal take on some of the work that will be on view for the general public in that exhibition next year. Uh, just a quick, quick procedural thing. If you have a question at any point uh, during Doug's presentation, feel free to put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And Doug will talk for about 45 minutes and then I will help moderate the discussion, read the questions for, out loud for everybody from the Q&A box and give Doug a chance to answer them. So with that, I am very happy to pass the screen over to Doug and welcome him. Good evening, everybody. I have to say thank you to Leslie, Jana, and Yesenia for the opportunity to present the work to you this evening. I also would like to thank Linda Duke at the Beach Museum of Art for making the introduction to Leslie, um, which granted me this opportunity to be here with you tonight. <clears throat> tonight, I'll discuss a little bit of how I got started with my homeless veteran project. Um, as Yesenia said, I'll also speak on some of my protest work and one of my passion projects, along with the Homeless Veteran Project, which is the Yuma Street Project. So I'm going to share my screen and begin. In 2018, um, I was on a business trip while I was working a corporate job and I was leaving the downtown area uh, business district right where the railway subway uh, meets in the downtown area and just over the gentleman by the name of Leo's left shoulder uh, is where I passed him and just behind where I would be standing facing him uh, is the intersection and he asked me he said uh, young man he said do you mind if you spare some change for me and in that moment just like probably anybody else has in their lifetime uh, my first reaction was no but i also had my camera with me and i asked him did he mind sharing his story with me when he began speaking to me I, I kind of tried to humble myself and, and hear everything he said, um, because again, I, I was raised where I don't feel like anybody is, you know, above me or beneath me, but I wanted to hear his, his story. Um, and I don't think I was prepared for what he said, uh, but he went on to tell me that he was a former Marine and he worked for the fire station, uh, I think engine number four in Chicago. Um, and he fell on the roof of a burning building and after he had fell into the roof in the burning building, he told me that uh, he had sought help from the union and he also sought help from the VA, uh, both which declined to help him. Um, and shortly after that, he told me that his wife, Betty, passed away. Um, and he said between a combination of the circumstances of falling through the roof and not being able to get help. And after losing his wife, he found himself living on the streets. Um, and in that moment, it humbled me because, you know, I kind of had prejudged him, um, just like many of us probably have all done. Um, and he simply needed change um, that he wanted to fill up in his cup. And this was the beginning of the project. Uh, I didn't have a title for the project, but I told myself while I was down here for the next three days, I said, how powerful is that, that we as people, we prejudge people, um, we make judgments on people before we even actually know the story of what the individual is going through. So I had Malika with me and I asked him if I could take his photograph. Um, and this was the first photograph um, of the Homeless Veteran Project in 2018 that has led me to travel to 16 states and document up until the pandemic, 75 total veterans. So this was Leo. 
as I started working my way through the project, I started getting support from people across the country reaching out to me through social media. Uh, and right here in Manhattan, a former veteran uh, by the name of Pete Frasco told me that he wanted to support the project. Um, he asked me, could he give me money? And I told him no, because I said, I want, I, I wasn't set up for that. So I essentially told him, I said, here's what we can do. I said, if you buy me a flight, I'll go to whatever state you want me to go to and I'll document homelessness in that state. So he bought me a plane ticket to Portland, Oregon. And in Portland, Oregon, I got there. Um, I got set up at my Airbnb and the next morning, I met this veteran right here who had just recently had his shoes stolen because he was sleeping under an awning. And this was his diary that he wrote. Um, he was a former army veteran, served at Fort Benning, Georgia, which is where I went uh, through my training. Um, and this was a moment where he documented his experience uh, that night. Uh, when he woke up, he was frustrated because his ID, his cash, um, everything that he owned was in his shoes. Um, and the district that he was in um, was an area where homelessness was very rampant. Um, as far as the eye could see, you could see tents, you could see people sleeping on the streets. Uh, but I felt that this was important um, to share because again, ha to have the ability to have paper, to have a pencil, to have the ability to write and express what he was going through during that moment. I felt was really important to, to document and share um, with people to know that, you know, not everybody has a, a, a great life, has a great upbringing, but his ability to be able to document what he is going through and his ability to write poetically um, in such a vulnerable state in his life. His name was Brian. This was in Seattle, Washington at a Starbucks. Uh, I found this guy to be very interesting. Um, and if you wanna read all of the stories of each individual veteran, um, feel free to go to my website and you can go to each veteran and their story is attached, but I'll go through each one because I remember each veteran. Um, and this veteran was a National Guard veteran. Um, and he was also served as a combat medic and a medic is basically a nurse, uh, medical personnel in the military. And this moment, I captured him playing his guitar, which was his downtime. And I asked him, what do you mean your downtime? And he said, because he likes to work at night. So what he does is every night he goes to all of the hospitals and behind each hospital, they throw away endless amounts of product that could be used for others. And he essentially went to each hospital in the area to get medical supplies to go and help other veterans and other homeless individuals living on the streets. And it was a touching moment because, you know, here he is in a multi billion dollar company um, drinking a cup of coffee and playing his guitar um, before he goes out for what he considers doing his work. Um, so I took the time to take this photograph and share because. Again, you know, the individuals are in vulnerable states in their lives and, you know, people constantly ask, you know, what can I do to help? What can I do to, you know, can I get them an apartment? You know, can I get them a job? And individuals that are living on the streets, one thing I've learned over the past three years of doing this is most of the individuals are looking for where they're going to sleep safely at night, where they are going to get their next meal, and how long it's gonna be before they are able to get out of the current circumstance they're in. You know, they don't have email addresses. You can't email them. You know, there's no way to uh, assist them other than, you know, providing them what you can provide at the time. Um, he had a little bit of pocket change, which was his way of being able to buy coffee. And the people at Starbucks were graciously nice enough to allow him to play his guitar inside. This individual was in downtown Chicago, kind of a similar situation. Um, the individual was in the Navy and he goes around to all of the dumpsters in the alleys in downtown Chicago to dump trash for a lot of the companies 
And this was his moment after we had finished talking where he said, you know, I just want to go to sleep because most of the individuals that live on the streets sleep during the day. And you'll notice that you'll see them sleeping during the day because they work at night because they can't be in public. They can't loiter. They can't be in, 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 in businesses where us normal individuals live or, you know, frequent. So in this moment, uh, we talked for about 20 minutes. And after I turned around to wait for traffic to pass, I, I made the photograph. Um, but this was his moment where he just wanted to close his eyes and get a little bit of sleep. Dallas, Texas, <clears throat> this individual in the military, we call it CIF. I can't think of the acronym, but it's central. It's where we turn in all of our military gear when we get out. Uh, this individual kept his, his, his tent, his sleeping bag, and you can see at the bottom of the screen, just above his tennis shoes, he's got a, a uniform in his duffel bag, but he did this because he didn't have shelter. This was his shelter. Um, you can see the to-go box right there at the bottom left of the screen. Um, the individual was asleep. Uh, we talked, he was sitting on the curb when I walked past. Um, I knew that pattern, the pattern on the far left, we call it multi-cam, the pattern to the right that looks somewhat digital is the uh, digital ACU, um, which caught my attention and let me know that he was probably somewhat in the military. Um, and people always ask, you know, how do you know? How do you know that this is not something that they got? Um, and just like any industry, you know, you know the common language to use when speaking to somebody in your industry. So I asked him what his MOS was, which is, stands for the Military Occupational Specialty. He shared with me his rank. Um, with inside of this tent was most of his private belongings, um, and he was able to leave this tent right here. But again, it's a it's a moment of seeing somebody's full existence, full being right here uh, for the world to see, you know, as a homeless person, you lose all humility um, when you're living on the streets. So there is no shame uh, for these individuals. This is one of my, one of my favorites. Uh, this was in downtown New York. Uh, I can't remember the intersection, but this guy's name was Jeremy. And he talked to me for quite a while, but again, in this moment, you know, this is Christmas, um, everybody's got their Starbucks uh, in their own, in their own way, going in their own direction. Um, and here he was, you know, begging for change. Um, he had told me he had sought out work for quite a long time, um, was unsuccessful in trying to get work employment. Um, and I think a lot of times individuals, they just give up, they give up the fight, they give up the will to to survive um, because you've, you've lost it all. And after we talked for about uh, a good 15, 20 minutes, you know, he asked me, could he get back to work? Because he said this was the five o'clock rush hour traffic time. And this was the time where he would be able to earn as much money as he could. Um, but yeah, this was New York. <clears throat> Denver, Colorado. Uh, this veteran was a veteran that served at 1st Infantry Division, which is right here in Kansas, uh, right outside of Manhattan, about 15 minutes or so. But he made his way out to Denver. Um, this was my first morning in Denver. Um, I had an Airbnb. I got up, got my coffee, and I hit the streets, and not even around my first corner. Uh, here he was. He actually went to the first if I recall, he said he went to the first black military school um, in, in Denver where he was raised, um, which was his home. Um, but he ended up back being here after his service in the military. Um, we talked again, some some of well, the same situation. You know, he was trying to get the morning rush hour traffic to get as much money as he could because he said he hadn't eaten in a few days. But uh, a lot of times at intersection, he's able to gain enough money to save up to get enough for a meal. Um, and in Denver, um, you know, as you can see, he's wearing this, his beanie and his coat um, and he's got gloves on, two different gloves, different matching gloves, uh, but out, it was freezing. Um, and I asked him how long he would stay out there and he said he would stay out there until he could earn enough to uh, put a full meal in his body. Uh, 
back to New York, Emily, um, she is sitting right in front of uh, Macy's store. Uh, this was Christmas again, 2018 and people were passing shopping. Uh, she was embarrassed. She served as a supply technician um, in the Navy. Um, she got out. She told me how, how cold she felt as a human being that not necessarily physically cold, but cold in a world where she didn't feel like she had any help. Um, she, when we talked, uh, I, I literally sat right beside her and, you know, she didn't want to look at me. I asked her, did she mind if I made a photograph? And uh, she said she didn't mind because she said she, she was ashamed of where she was, but she said that she had lost all respect for herself. So I tried to give her some encouraging words and uh, asked if she had reached out into any of the uh, local uh, veteran organizations in the area to see if she could get help. Um, it's very rare that I catch females on the streets as homeless, homelessness and homelessness or homeless veterans, um, because women typically have a little bit easier time getting into shelters, unlike the men do. Uh, so when I found her and she shared with me that she was a veteran, um, I just knew that I had to make a photograph. This is Samuel. This is in downtown Atlanta, just outside of Centennial Olympic Park. Um, there's a roundabout to the right side of the screen where the car is over his shoulder, kind of loops around. And as I was coming around the corner, I was trying to find somewhere to park. And I found a, found a place to park, which was outside of a homeless shelter over to the right side of the image. His name is Samuel. He served in the Marine Corps. Uh, he went to 29 Palms, which is the basic training on the West Coast for the Marine Corps. Uh, but he found his way out to Atlanta, Georgia. And it's probably one of my favorite stories that I share with everybody. Uh, and I could tell he was somewhat military. It's got an old military style cap on and in his pants, you can't really see it, but he's got on black boots and he had on black BDUs and they were somewhat creased. And it, it led me to believe that he was an older veteran, but he still kept up some of the same training and standards of trying to keep himself together. And he kept a clean shave. So as I walked over, he's sitting on a cardboard box under the tree. It was probably a good 90 degrees in Atlanta. And I asked him, could I sit? And of course, just like with anything, you know, you're getting people's personal space and people are uncomfortable. So I stayed at a distance and I shared with him my time in the military and we had a conversation. And he went to tell me that he had recently got kicked out of the homeless shelter, which was across the street for fighting. And I said, Samuel, you look like you're in your mid fifties to sixties. And he said, yes, I'm 61. And I said, you're my father's age. And I said, what are you doing fighting? He said, I was fighting because for the past three months, I was getting jumped by three young thugs in the area. And on the first of the month is when military VA disability compensation gets kicks in. So it was when he gets his money and he was kick, getting jumped and he was getting his money taken. And on this third month, he defended himself and he fought off the three young thugs. But what happened was the administration of the homeless shelter saw him and they ended up kicking him out because it had violated their policy. And because he was kicked out of the homeless shelter, the VA will not send him his VA compensation because he no longer has a registered address. So now he has to go around to all of the local shelters to get his name put on a waiting list in hopes that he can get an address so that he can get his back pay. And it was, it was one of those moments where it hit me because, again, this individual had a roof over his head. Maybe he, sh he could have done things differently. Maybe he could have reported it. But again, in this moment, you have a man that's, you know, my father's age that uh, has done his time, he served his country and he's, he's essentially living on the streets with no money. Um, so this was Samuel, Marine Corps. This was just before the pandemic. I was with my buddy, Luke, we were in New York. Uh, he was uh, photographing for the Macy's Day Parade and we were walking the streets making photographs and uh, Luke actually spotted this one out to me and he said, Doug, I think those are veterans right there. Husband and wife, the sign reads, U.S. Army veteran and wife, homeless and sleeping on the streets, waiting on temporary housing. 
just trying to survive. Anything is a blessing. Um, and the, in the parentheses, it says 91B, which is his military occupational specialty, which is a combat medic. And underneath that, it says 2ID, which is 2nd Infantry, Divi Infantry Division. Um, and he says underneath that in the small fine print, honorable discharge, thank you and God bless. So in this moment, he's letting you know on his resume on a cardboard box that he served honorably. He was a combat medic. He served with the 2nd Infantry Division and him and his wife uh, have everything that they own on the corner. I believe this is 42nd Street. Um, really hard, uh, really hard, hard to watch and witness. Um, anyone that has had family or has family, uh, I couldn't even imagine, you know, in, in New York, New York is crowded in itself, just alone by yourself, but to have personal belongings with you. But his wife, she, she played card, uh, crossword puzzles, um, which was her way to take her mind off of things. And um, this was that moment. And as you see, people are so used to it that they don't stop. And when Luke pointed it out to me, he actually made a video of me. I literally stopped in the middle of the intersection and had a conversation with these people. Um, and asked you know permission to make a photograph of them and they said that they didn't mind at all if it helped somebody else then they were up for it but i told them that i would honor them by sharing their stories and uh continuing to do what i do to the project this is another corner back in new york in 2018 i felt this one to be interesting uh the individual she was in the air force which is very rare that you find many Air Force veterans homeless. Um, but I thought the image was important because you obviously have three innocent little kids with their mother walking past and she was reading a book sitting outside of the building. Um, and I just, I felt like you have such an innocent kid who's obviously in his own world, the middle child talking to mom and sister, they're walking down the streets, going to their uh, dead destination. Um, and you just have somebody that's without everything that's literally sitting here um, on the streets. <clears throat> Another homeless veteran, um, homeless veteran sign that reads mother passed away, going through a hard time, losing all hope and faith, please help any way you can. It's just a, it's a common thing across America. Um, one of the things that I did just before I got out of the military, a, a small job that I had, I believe, in my last month was to help inventory uh, one of our military arms room. And I noted, I noticed that on our, our ledger, essentially, inventory, that we had roughly $200 million of unused equipment. And that unused equipment is, is equipment that's no longer in service, That's whether that's vehicles, equipment, um, and it got me thinking early in this project that, you know, if my one unit had that in excess of extra equipment times every other unit on Fort Riley, along with every other base in the army, along with every other branch in the military, and you take that unused equipment and you can take a percentage of that and put that back into homelessness, then you may be able to put a dent into the massive problem that I as one photographer has seen across America. Um, and again, my beginning goal was to obtain and find at least three veterans in each state and to hit all 50 states. Um, and there's been some states where I get 14, I get 12. Um, and then there's sometimes there's times where I, I you just you don't have enough time to get everybody. So again, it's uh, it's uh, it's something that uh, makes you really think. <clears throat> Back to Chicago. Um, this was the third veteran of the beginning after Leo. Um, he didn't want his face shown, so I had to find a way to make a photograph. But uh, you know, he told me he said, you know, why would you make a photograph of me? And I said, it's, it's not to make a photograph of you to humiliate you or embarrass you, but to show the state of which you are in as a human being 
hopefully tugs at the heartstrings of someone else that may be willing to help or may be willing to do something. Because again, if we can change individuals' minds and individuals' thinking, then hopefully the next person that walks by at least wants to hear your story and may be able to help you get to a better place in life uh, as long as you're willing. So he was, he was, he was gracious, enough, gracious enough to allow me. So I, I walked around the steps because I was on the steps below him uh, when we were talking, but then I came around and I, I used the framing from the railing to, to cover up his face so that, uh, you know, would share the identity, not share the identity of who he was. <clears throat> this was Jeremy, this, I think it's Jeremy or Jermaine, I have to double check that, but this was LA, got to LA, uh, couldn't check into my Airbnb until three o'clock, and um, this was right beyond a Starbucks. Um, this individual was uh, in the Navy, um, got out of the Navy, and um, told me that he had just finished using uh, narcotics. Um, and in this moment, he told me that the reason he was using was because he had sought help from the VA, uh, obviously when the opioid crisis was huge, but he was essentially using narcotics because he could no longer get painkillers from the VA to help with the pain that he had uh, gone through during his time in service. Um, and that's essentially where his life had led him to. Um, I asked him, I said, do you mind if I take your photograph? Um, and I've, I've gotten people to ask me, you know, well, why would you share these things? It's, it's real life. Um, if you don't see it, you don't know about it. Because again, if we don't see it, then we're stuck in our own ways. We're stuck in our own individual paths. And the only way to shed light on something is to allow others to see it. Um, but this was in Los Angeles, downtown LA. Back to New York. Um, I've gone to New York a couple times and I just keep finding more veterans and I'll just keep sharing. But again, this was in downtown. Uh, again, I was with Luke. We were coming around a corner and uh, a veteran right here uh, in a moment of solitude um, where he's, he has nothing, you know, other than a cup with some change. This was in Boston. Um, downtown Boston. I got to Boston and I think I ended up finding 14 veterans. Uh, when I first got there, I couldn't find a single one. And one of the early logistical operational things that I learned doing the Homeless Veteran Project in year one was it's not smart to go to cold states during cold months. I probably should go to cold states during the hot months. Um, and then this first year I was in Boston and I think it was in the negatives. Uh, I was walking around. Anyone who knows me knows that I'm a cold nature person and I stay cold. So to be walking around in downtown Boston looking for homeless veterans, I couldn't find them until I found this individual right here. Uh, he was a, I think he calls the name of the boat a frigate boat. Um, I can't explain to you what it is, but I remember he was telling me it was like a support vessel for other supporting Navy vessels. Uh, any Navy veterans out there would have to correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially he became my chaperone. And during the time uh, I couldn't find any veterans. And he told me, he says, you know what? He says, if you can buy me a cup of coffee, I'll show you where everybody is. And we walked for about three or four blocks and we went around the corner to the, at the time the Boston Celtic stadium was being built and all of the homeless veterans and other homeless individuals were down in the bottom of the uh, industrial area where they were being fixed and he took me around to individuals I sat and talked because it was so many um, I was a little uncomfortable because again uh, in the place where I was we went downstairs a couple flights and I had kind of lost my sense of direction so again you know with my training and experience and past careers I kind of knew that I wasn't really situationally aware to where I was uh, in terms of directions but I knew that I didn't want to bring out my camera and make them feel uncomfortable. So I made his photograph. Um, and once I got more comfortable, the next day I came back and they, they saw that I obviously was coming back to hear more of their stories and I made more photographs. But uh, in this moment we were talking and um, 
I asked, could I make his photograph and share his story? And uh, he did. He allowed me. Another awesome veteran. Um, this was in Denver. Um, you know, at first glance, you look at this and you're saying, oh, he's picking up cans because he wants to turn cans into pocket change. And that was absolutely the first thought that came to my mind. I said, well, where are you going to put all your cans? And then you're going to turn them into recycling. And then what do you normally make off the cans? He says, man, I do not need these cans. He says, as homeless, we have to keep our streets clean so that people respect us enough to at least have a conversation with us. So in this moment, he was picking up trash of other veterans because anyone who's been to Denver knows that Denver and LA and Portland are probably three of the biggest states I've been to that have the biggest homeless issue. Um, so after he woke up and got himself together, he, he brushed his teeth and he did what he could for his hygiene. Uh, he went around and started picking up trash. Um, and in the same moment, uh, it, was, it was cold as well. You can see he's got a multiple layer pants and then underneath, it looks like a long john top. We call it polypropylene, which is like under, under, like long john under armor gear uh, that the military issues you. Um, but this was the veteran stand down day. Um, and he ended up being my chaperone uh, to find other veterans. And we went to the veteran stand down day in Denver um, at their conference center where uh, probably 500 to 1,000 people were in the building and companies, uh, people would take pictures for headshots for individuals trying to get jobs. They did HIV STD checks. Uh, they allowed individuals to take shoes and turn shoes in for winter boots. Um, I think each state has one. I'm not familiar um, when it happens, but this was uh, where we were headed to after he picked these cans up. Then we walked probably six blocks to, um, go to the veteran stand down day, but this was Denver, Colorado. <clears throat> in New York, again, uh, this was late night, uh, another veteran standing on the corner above the 34th Street Penn Station uh, Railway, a, mil a veteran who uh, I believe he was, he was in the army for sure. I can't remember which uh, division he was, I think he said third infantry division, but again, he kept a lot of his military gear because he knew that the gear was tested for when he was in the military and it served him greatly when he was in and he decided to keep it when he got out. But again, in this moment, you know, you got somebody with their Apple earbuds wearing a Patagonia coat and this other lady had, you know, more bags that she could carry, but then you have this individual who, has nothing. Um, he's on a cell phone, but it's not an active cell phone. It was a phone that he got from a pawn shop that allowed him to keep phone numbers in it and keep his information, uh, like his notes for you know bus bus transfers and information for personal information. And this is the last of the homeless veterans. This was down in Tampa. Um, this individual is actually from Lawrence, Kansas, uh, but lived in Tampa. He said that he could not endure the colds in Kansas anymore. Um, and it was very interesting because, you know, as you go through the states, you start seeing a lot of commonalities, you know, layers of clothes, you know. But when you get to somewhere like Florida, it was different because in my mind, I was looking for what I thought homelessness looked like. But in Florida, it's complete opposite. Everybody's in T-shirts and shorts. So I was walking past the area where I was starting out in St. Pete, looking for individuals that I assumed looked like they were homeless. But what it ended up being was individuals in Florida, their winters are 70 degrees. So in November of 2019, just before the pandemic, um, I was able to meet with this individual who was with another veteran uh, who shared their stories, but they lived in a cove um, and that cove um, allowed them to fish and get food for themselves. So one of the things they do is when they panhandle and they earn money, they put their money towards live tackle to be able to fish in the cove because again, this cove produced tons of tilapia, tons of flounder. So they would live in the cove, they would fish for free other than getting bait, they were able to have a little bit better livelihood than some of the other states that I had noticed. So that's the end right there of the homeless veterans. So we will move on to the protest.
<clears throat> this was in Junction City. This was the um, second peaceful protest that I had been to thus far in, in the uh, Flint Hills region. And I thought this was interesting, uh, being a black male. What if your son was black? Um, and I, I kind of targeted this series around, since yesterday was uh, International Women's Day, I felt the need to put a spread together, an edit together that focused on women. Um, and as I was going through my photographs, I noticed that, and I know for a fact, one of the individual females here is an active duty veteran, active duty in the army. And she spearheaded and led a lot of the protests here in the area. Um, and I thought it was important to share because again, you know, many of us men, black men come from black mothers um, and whether they're mixed, whether they were biracial, whether they were of uh, other ethnicities, uh, the women were out in force uh, just as much as the men. <clears throat> then we come back to Manhattan, Kansas. This was a drone shot that I got with the help of a friend who works at the Bluemont. Um, this was 2000 plus people in Manhattan, Kansas, going down Lumont Avenue uh, to the far right of the image is where we call Triangle Park, which is where the event started. And then to the far left goes down to about a roundabout um, where our, our local Walgreens McDonald's is. And from the drone shot, I was in legal flying space, but I couldn't capture the 2000 plus pe people without trying to um, you know, crop individuals out. But I thought it was powerful to see that many people come out to support, you know, what they feel um, was a tragedy of, you know, George Floyd, um, as this trial goes on right now. Um, everybody, all races, all nationalities, uh, nothing was burned, nobody rioted, nobody looted. Um, there was no, there was no arguing. This was a peaceful protest in Manhattan, Kansas. I thought this was a powerful image. Uh, many don't know about Juneteenth, but uh, Juneteenth was the freedom of uh, the African American community. Um, and in this image, uh, you see two black hands being freed. Um, and this was one of the signs that was uh, made at one of the protests here in Manhattan, Kansas. I thought this was a powerful image. Um, our local police department came out, our local chief of police uh, came out to speak to the community. Uh, he gave a heartfelt speech. Um, he poured his heart out in terms of how he felt, um, what happened to Mr. Floyd um, impacted him. Uh, he shared his experience. Um, the female in the Bob Marley t-shirt was one of the protest leaders. Uh, organizers, and I thought it was, you know, powerful to have this young female girl standing beside her, um, listening to the chief of police, um, our local police department, uh, come together again. This was in Triangle Park. Um, everybody came, local law enforcement spoke with the individuals within the community, answered questions, um, and uh, along with my colleagues, we we made photographs, and I just felt like this was one of the one of the ones that stuck with me. And then we go back to Junction City. Um, again, females, you know, letting their voices be heard, you know, their sons, their, their, their husbands. Some of these are wives of spouses in the military. Um, local, local law enforcement was outside and they let every concern known to man be voiced to them. Um, and uh, they wanted to let local law enforcement know how they feel for you know the injustices that are happening across our country uh, for those individuals with skin that's uh, darker than theirs. This is Kanisha, uh, the female that I was talking about earlier. She led probably three or four protests. Um, and when I say led, she had that that microphone and uh, she 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 had chance. Um, people followed her, um, and again, powerful young lady. This is an active duty army 
uh, soldier at Fort Riley. And again, uh, I, I can't say enough about her. She, she, she led every protest. She led every protest. Again, this mother uh, in Junction City uh, had her young son. She said that she was out here because one day her son would be a young black man. And uh, like, like the other individuals there, this, this was the first protest that I went to in Junction. Um, we started back at the, uh, the local park and she marched around holding her young son around the city, around the park, through the, to the police station and then back to the park again. <clears throat> again females uh out out in numbers out in uh in the masses here in junction city uh made this frame uh the light i just felt the love the light the way that the light hit the people as they came came through this intersection uh it was difficult because again it was such a long a long line that uh you have to kind of plan out where you want to make your photograph but uh right in downtown junction city on washington street um Again, another peaceful protest in the Flint Hills. We come back to Manhattan, Kansas. This was after the previous photograph was made, uh, came back to Manhattan and there was another small gathering on uh, Lumon Avenue across from the Beach Museum. Um, and this mother um, was sharing her concerns. Um, Another female <clears throat> in Junction City. I think the sign says says enough. Um, I think the conversations around uh, blacks being killed uh, is a, is a conversation that uh, I think we're all tired of having, but it's a conversation that uh, needs to happen more. Um, and the only way to make the change is to have the conversations, the hard conversations to learn, because you're, you're not going to understand what it feels like to be in the shoes of a black person. Um, I mean, just just recently in the news, Amanda Gorman, the young black female poet who gave the speech at the inauguration was stopped, I believe, from security or law enforcement um, because it says she looks suspicious. Um, Again, that situation could have turned out a lot worse. I'm glad it didn't for her sake, but again, black females. Another young black female in, um, I think she's biracial female in uh, Manhattan, Kansas. This was on Bluemont, um, came back after the protests and made some frames. I think this, this whole protest was nothing but uh, females on Bluemont. Back on Bluemont, Manhattan, Kansas, in police brutality. This image was made in Junction City. Um, this is actually Aline Wang, uh, curator for the Beach Museum of Art, but uh, she came out in support to let her voices be heard to, you know, let people hear your voice, let people hear your concerns, have conversations um, right in the Flint Hills. And again, another black female in Junction City, she got on stage, she shared her heart, um, she cried her eyes out, you know, sharing her pain of having brothers, having siblings, um, husband, um, of what's going on in America. I mean, I think every African American will share their experience at some point or another, but uh, we feel it, uh, we know it, that there are two Americas and the America that we live in and the America that anybody else that is uh, not black lives in. And this was the tail end of the, uh, the 2000 plus people in Manhattan, Kansas. I mean, you can look in the crowd and you can see every race coming together, male, female uh, signs that are all in support of, 
of equality, you know, Black Lives Matter. Um, very powerful, very powerful to see this many people um, in, in the center of the United States, Manhattan, Kansas, uh, I thought was impressive. Again, the mothers, the women, local pastor in the back, letting their voices be heard. This is a mother and a son. She said that she wanted to ensure that her kids knew what a peaceful protest looked like. Uh, rest in peace to Sandra Bland, rest in peace to George Floyd uh, with the t-shirts that they had made. <clears throat> they had been there the whole time, uh, walked around and marched around the plaza and then also around the downtown area and came back. Uh, but I thought it was important to make a frame of this, uh, these two individuals that were killed. And then this sign is flexing in my complexion, Black Lives Matter, don't be on the wrong side of history, protect the black woman. You know, you have these two minority females out here holding signs. Um, and again, I felt like it was important to make frames of, of the signs because again, you know, people's voices are written, heartfelt messages written on these signs. And again, when you're at a protest, you feel like you have to capture everything um, and you're constantly, constantly uh, looking around to find, you know, what you can make photographs of, but, you know, to have these two different minority females uh, holding up the different signs, uh, I felt like it was a cool frame to make. And that is the end of the peaceful protest. And the last series is the Yuma Street Project, my passion project that I've been working on for another two years as well. Yuma Street is, I'm gonna say about a quarter of a mile, could be a little bit longer, goes from 4th Street to 17th Street and 17th Street has now been turned into Martin Luther King Memorial Drive. Um, Yuma Street is south of points, um, a little bit of the demographics, it's primarily made up of minority community, the Blacks, the Asians, the Latinos. Um, there has been some regentrification of the area um, of some of the streets, uh, including like uh, Colorado and a few of the other streets in the area. But uh, I mean, we go back to the times of segregation where, you know, Blacks were forced to have to live on Yuma Street. You know, Black athletes couldn't live on campus at K-State. Black soldiers could not live on Fort Riley um, because of the color of their skin. Uh, I honestly feel like this road needs to be made a, a historical site um, because the house that Jackie Robinson and Joe Lewis lived in still stands today. Um, it actually has been unoccupied for about six months and I believe new renters just moved in. I started documenting Yuma Street um, Two years ago, uh, a marketing agency by the name of SEG Media uh, was working with them on the Juneteenth Festival. And I had made a comment that alluded to uh, Yuma Street being, from what I had heard, not being a local, uh, the hood. And um, she said, Doug, you need to go, go, go learn about Yuma Street yourself and don't listen to the rumors. So the only thing I knew to do was to take my camera out. And the first year in 2018, I would just literally go sit and just observe. And I would sit and it was very peaceful. It was very quiet from a photography perspective. The light was amazing in the evenings and in the mornings, but I just couldn't understand where the negative connotation was coming from. And it was coming from um, because Yuma Street at one point did have um, uh, an excess of drugs in the area. Um, but again, you know, when you look at the, the, the generational issues of where you force a, a, a collective of people to live, um, 
and, and push them into a impoverished area, you're going to bring, you know, the good and the bad into the area. The demographics are south of points. Um, you've got trailer parks across Fort Riley Boulevard. You've got low income housing. You've got duplexes. Um, and obviously with the tax hikes of, of the county and the leadership in the town, you know, you're going to force people to only be able to live in an area where, you know, is only affordable to a means of income that these people are only able to afford. Um, so with, with, with that being said, Yuma Street became a passion project of mine to document what I saw. This is Mrs. Hall. Um, I haven't released this photograph, so this is the first time this photograph's been out there. Um, Miss Hall is the oldest, I'm sorry, is the longest living resident of Yuma Street. Um, her home is 100 plus years old. Um, her daughter is probably the biggest supporter and ally and helped me obtain a lot of information, um, being that they grew up there. Um, Miss Hall, uh, one of her favorite things to do is play her puzzles, um, but she is uh, she wears hearing aids because uh, I'm not sure if she's legally deaf, but she has a hard time hearing. But this was a moment that uh, her daughter Joy allowed me to come in and, and make photographs with mom. Um, they actually just made me some incredible lasagna not too long ago um, because I shared during the Thanksgiving holidays gift baskets from Little Apple Brewery um, and took Thanksgiving turkeys to every resident that shared their stories with me. This is Miss Cole. Uh, Miss Cole is the oldest living female on Yuma Street. She hasn't lived on Yuma Street as long as Miss Hall has, but Miss Arlene Cole, uh, 94 years old, she was married uh, previously to her first husband um, who passed away and then remarried, um, which brought her to Manhattan, Kansas, where she worked. And then upon her retirement, she uh, still lives on Yuma Street to this day. And uh, 94 years old has successfully made it through the pandemic. Uh, she was probably the hardest one to get in touch with, obviously, because of her age and with the pandemic. Uh, once she was able to, late spring last year, come sit on her front porch, allow me to talk with her and share her story. <laughs> This is Mr. Lazone Gray Sr. Um, Joy, the daughter of Mrs. Hall, asked me while I was doing my project, she says, Doug, have you met Lazone? And I said, no, ma'am, I have not met Lazone. She said, well, you need to meet Lazone. She was like, I think he's been in World War II and maybe the Korean War, but he's 101 years old and he lives on Yuma Street. And I said, what? So without, <laughs> without, missing a beat. I went to the address that she provided me and I went and met Lazone. Um, he actually did serve in World War II and the Korean War. He was in the military during the time where it was segregated and upon it being integrated fully with black and white soldiers, he got his first handshake and salute from his commission, his senior officer. Um, he shared with me on audio he shared with me some of his ribbons and awards. He shared with me one of the rifles that he carried during the time of his service. Um, this man is a living legend. Um, so again, the negative connotation of Yuma Street being a bad area, I have not seen it. And I have studied the uh, crime reports. Um, I've looked at the metrics. I've observed what I've observed with my own eyes. And in two and a half, almost three years, um, I have not seen major crime in the area. Now, the, the notion is that uh, two years ago, there was a drug house that uh, was hit by local law enforcement uh, for a narcotics um, raid. And they seized, I believe it was excess amount of uh, pills from a Chicago gang. Um, and they, they very frequent the area because they're obviously looking for the local, uh, the lower level drug dealers that are pushing narcotics and they're kind of circling the area to keep their eye on it. But the notion that Yuma Street is a bad area, I haven't seen it. So in the next couple of photographs, you'll see 
you know, the nationalities. This is, these are the African-Americans that come out and play basketball on the basketball court. <clears throat> the Asian community that comes and plays basketball at the same court, Yuma Street, to the left, left of the basketball goal. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but over here is the Douglas Center. And then the Asian, and then the, uh, the Latino community uh, all use the same court. Um, all minorities, all respectively coming out just to have a good time and uh, enjoy the Yuma Street basketball court, um, which is adjacent to the Douglas Center. Um, and this building in the background is the beginning of the pandemic when it was going up. That is the new Douglas Center. Um, underneath that Douglas Center, as Mr. Baker will tell you, uh, is where the original black pool for the blacks that could not cross over points had to go swimming in this in the summertime um, and where and one of the messages that he gave to me is is that when people come into this new douglas center community center they will be standing on the grounds of where the black community originally was which is where mr baker's um mother ran the pool <clears throat> And one of the big issues that I guess is still going on now was the food insecurity. Uh, this is Mount Zion uh, Worship Center um, on Yuma Street. Uh, the local community, the local pastor, and uh, I think it was A and H Farm. Um, a local farm got together with the church during the food insecurity um, to give out free food on Yuma Street. And this is one of the young individuals from the church um, who was helping pass out food during that time. Again, this is the food that was delivered, and these are some of the pastor's sons. The two individuals on bikes uh, came down to get free boxes of food um, last year, and uh, obviously masks were worn because this was still during the pandemic. I thought this image was important to make because, again, you know, as you look, there's nothing but Asian, Latino, Black, Hispanic, children on the playground um and one of the biggest things that the people always ask me is this why are the police always over here why are the police always going back and forth and you know on the street constantly checking on us um my previous career i kind of understand it um but at the same time you know when you want to know why a certain race or my, or ethnicity is uncomfortable with law enforcement or acts the way that they see an individual acts on national television or in the videos when an individual is killed is because they are raised at a young age like this where they see law enforcement, they're fearful of law enforcement and law enforcement is ingrained in them because they know no different because they saw it all of their life. So these individuals, these kids that see law enforcement go up and down the street um, in an effort to, you know, reduce crime on a street over is putting fear in individuals. So um, I thought it was important to make this image because again, it's, 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 uh, there's nothing but minorities out here. This image was made a few days ago. Uh, <laughs> These kids live uh, on the, I guess, what is that? Northeast, west end of Yuma Street. Um, I've talked to their mothers a couple of times. Their parents actually are Yuma Street natives, born and raised on Yuma Street. They were telling me about, you know, what Yuma Street used to look like when their parents were growing up and how they used to be little rugrats in the area. Uh, and you got three shirts and still I rise and racism tried to steal my joy, ha. It tried. So these three, you know, these three young kids um, sitting in front of the new Douglas Center. Obviously, you saw in the earlier photo it in the frame stage, um, and the Douglas Center will now be opening here soon, I believe. Again, more Yuma Street residents. Um, this is the actual house that Mr. Giles lived in. Um, when I believe Joe Lewis and Jackie Robinson lived next door. Um, and when Satchel Pay played for the Negro Leagues and Mr. Baker played on the Negro Leagues with them and used to catch for Satchel Page, this house that's right next to them. And again, more of the, the black community sitting out. Uh, this was 
around the time we started getting restrictions lifted and individuals came outside to enjoy a cold beer on their front porch. This little young girl <clears throat> on Yuma Street, her mama's artist, uh, Miss Lax. Uh, you can't see it in this image. I have another image, but uh, she's she had heart surgery at a young age. Um, her mother standing there behind her um, has half of a heart, half of a heart, such a young age. But this uh, young girl, um, Yuma Street resident with her mom, um, shared their stories with me. Um, I've seen them a few times. I can drive up and down Yuma Street. I wave, I toot the horn, I speak to everybody. Everybody knows me. They've seen my Jeep drive up and down Yuma. Um, they know what I'm there for. Um, and I thought this was a powerful image. Again, the youth of Yuma Street, you know, hopefully, um, never mind. Another veteran, uh, Air Force veteran, uh, lives on Yuma Street. He was cutting grass of a resident. Um, I talk, I talked with him a couple times um, during the pandemic. Uh, he drives his tractor around, his lawnmower. He cuts grass for a lot of the local residents and um, helps out some of the community citizens here on Yuma Street. Doug, I wanted to just jump in quickly and say we do have some questions and I want to make sure that we leave a little bit of time for Q&A. Okay. Uh, so, um, I, I'm not sure how many more photographs you wanted to talk about with Yuma Street, but um, maybe we'll come back to them if there's something that comes up as part of the Q&A. Yeah, you can you can go ahead and start shooting questions. I think I'm getting near the end, but you can go ahead and start asking the questions. Okay, so um, there were a few questions about the Homeless Veteran Project, and I also had questions, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, first ask the ones that came in through the Q&A. So Luke Townsend, is asking, with working with the homeless, how can we as passerby citizens bridge the gap between those with better situations than others? Having lived in New York myself, there's a lot of judgment of they'll just use money for drugs or booze. You're not helping them, just enabling, which clearly isn't always true. How can we create a more compassionate relationship towards the homeless? Good question, Luke. Um, I think and it's that, not and then there, so sorry, there's also a part two, and also how can you use this project to bring awareness to the failures of our government? Can projects like this help shift, shift the legislative narrative? So two part question, what can we do as individuals and how does it affect kind of government policy? Good question. I think the first thing we have to do as human beings is to uh, lead with our hearts. Um, and I say that to mean, you know, if you feel that you're gonna give somebody some money, um, then you're, you're hopeful that they would use that to help them. Um, if you want to buy them a meal, um, if you want to buy them a bus ticket, you know, ask them what they need, what are their wants. Uh, one of the individuals in New York, as I was passing by, he said he can go a week without hearing from a conversation from anybody. So just to have somebody speak to you is huge for a lot of the, the homeless that I have come across. So I think, you know, when you decide to help somebody, you can't go into it knowing that, hey, this may go to drugs or alcohol, but if they are using it for that, would led them to get to the drugs and the alcohol, find out what the underlying issue is. So it's to ask the one more question uh, to get to the, to the deeper, to the root of the issue. Um, and, you know, how can one get this to the, to the, to the government, the legislative bodies to help make change? Um, I think awareness. Um, I started a nonprofit um, because me, I'm just one photographer um, and I have been getting outpouring of individuals that want to help. And at the time, I didn't think through how impactful this would be um, through the narrative of, you know, the individuals, because I started the project to do it in black and white as to not show color, to keep it strictly focused on the veterans. Um, but that that same narrative turned into organizations wanting to help. And I wasn't set up nor prepared to take on any responsibility or any financial contributions. So with uh, people's help, like uh, <clears throat> retired Lieutenant Colonel Art DeGault suggested that I create a nonprofit to set myself up structurally to be able to receive funds to be able to help. Because a lot of times you have so many veterans that 
don't have funds. When they do get funds, they need to eat. But then they also need things like a bus ticket because a bus ticket allows them to get to medical. A bus ticket allows them to get from point A to point B to help themselves out. So small things like that, um, it, it's, it's baby steps, but hopefully through the awareness of the project um, can lead to bigger conversations. Um, that's, that's a great answer. And I, I just, for myself, I, I, I wanna say that I, I have so much respect and admiration for for that for you taking that step to start the conversation i don't know if it's true for other people but i feel like for me the kind of the awkwardness of speaking to a stranger who you think might want something from you <laughs> typically prevents me from starting that conversation but um i do think that it's so important and hearing you talk about it is a reminder to me at least that it's something that any of us can do and should do more often um so there's a kind of a related question, I think about your experience. So it says, Doug, the work you, from Grant Seymour, uh, the work you did in photographing homeless veterans must have been very difficult from an emotional perspective. Was that the case for you? Did you do anything to decompress or cope with this work? Could you comment at all on the mental health of those you photographed? And do you know if any were getting any assistance in that respect? Yes, it's uh, Yuma Street. Uh to me relates back to, and I, I know this is related to the homeless veterans, Yuma Street is easy because to me, it's it's a narrative that's happening right now in the news. You know, the segregation, the segregation, the the generation or the 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 institutional racism, the 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 problems that go on between the blacks and then the whites or the Latinos and the whites and the minority community um, and the impoverished areas. You know, when you put a, a group of people collectively in an area, you can only expect one thing to happen. So when I got to the homeless veteran project, it hit me hard because you, you know, you're wearing your clothes, you have your debit card, you have your money um, and you know, somebody, what you carry in your pocket or what you have in your Venmo account, you know, this would, suffice these individuals for weeks. So it was, it was very hard. So as I, again, as I went through the operational of like, what does it look like to go to a state and document this on each trip, you know, I would go two, three days, just depending on when I could get a cheap flight. But on the last day, I would always find a local co-working space to just go and just decompress because you hear these stories, you hear, you see these individuals, grown men, women, um, even like when I was in Boston, I think the youngest veteran that I came across was 22 years old. Um, so yeah, it is hard um, because you're, you're, you're absorbing through your lens, uh, the pain and suffering, and then you have to be able to take their narrative and put their narrative out there to the world to be able to see. Um, and I think, I can't remember which flight it was, but I was on my way back and a lady asked me what I was doing. She was like, you must be a photographer because you have your camera on your neck. And I said, I damn, she said, uh, you know, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm working on a project documenting homeless veterans. And her first response to me was, well, yeah, they must be all on drugs and alcohol. And I said, well, ma'am, I said, that's not actually the case. That is the case in some instances, but they got to drugs and alcohol because they're trying to suppress the pain of what they're going through. So uh, do many of them seek, get mental health? No, they don't get mental health because again, as I stated earlier, you know, when you're at the level of living on the streets, you're, you move during the night because businesses are closed and that's when you can move from point A to point B. Um, and you sleep during the daytime, which is why most homeless sleep during the daytime because they can't be in the areas where businesses are operating. So again, they deal with their issues at night and uh, it's, it's survival. So you know, when you, you when you ask the question, are they getting mental health? No, they don't even have medical help, which is why some of those medics um, and the, that I shared early on are going out trying to help with what they can. Um, I guess I, uh, Jana, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not seeing additional questions in the Q and A box. Am I missing something? While you respond to that, I, I have a question. I wanted to jump in. I guess I'm curious about the connection between your own military service and kind of the desire to focus specifically on veterans. And if you're finding that it that there is kind of a relationship between people having served in the military and ending up homeless, or they just, or there is kind of no 
connection. I know you 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 mentioned it one story where you said uh, somebody was using um, drugs to cope with pain, right? That they dealt with, that they um, got during their service. But anyway, I was wondering if you could say more about that. Yeah, so me, my, my story is a little bit unique because, you know, I worked in law enforcement after college and uh, I lived the normal life that a regular person lives. So I experienced what life was like prior to my military service. A lot of individuals go into the military because it's their last resort or they don't have another way. Um, and when they went into the service, you know, they were, what's a good way to say it? institutionalized or uh, they, they conform to Uncle Sam and that's all they know. So I think the army has to do a better job of on the enlisted side and the commission side, ensuring that soldiers are set up for success so that when they leave their service, they understand what it means to reintegrate back into society. And because they aren't fully trained and fully integrated, they're not typically prepared for, you know, resumes or, you know, the LinkedIn's and applying themselves to jobs and, you know, taking the necessary skills and translating them into corporate America or trades. So uh, a lot of individuals have good skills, but they fell by the wayside because they weren't properly set up for success or they just had unfortunate circumstances that led them to you know, one failure to the next and, you know, everybody has a story. So um, I think that's kind of what's prevalent ar um, around most of the veterans that I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, let's see. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm multitasking and trying to see if we have other, oh, okay, more questions, excellent. Okay. Um, so this is a question from Bridget Jackson. Imagery like music can be incredibly impactful. What impact do you feel your photos may have on people's lives? That's a good question coming from my sister. Um, what impact do I feel my photos have on people's lives? Um, I like to capture people, <clears throat> people in motion. And, you know, a lot of photographers, you know, focus on light, but if you focus on motion of, of people and the way they move, um, to me, it's an art. And I take that art that my mother says that I've had since I was a kid. And I put that into what I see through the camera. Um, and I'm constantly seeing, you know, as you know, most photographers, you know, they, they, their cameras with them all the time. So you're constantly seeing things and the ability to capture that and put that into the frame of a camera and, you know, make what you see in your camera uh, and, and share that, whether through a print or through a, a digital file, um, I think hopefully uh, shares what I see and translates into helping somebody through the, the documentary work that I'm, I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So related to that, um, there are a couple of questions kind of related to your practice as a photographer. What photographer has influenced you the most and what kind of adjustment to your scope and vision do you make between color and black and white? There's so many photographers out there. Obviously, you know, you've got your Eli Reeds, you've got your Gordon Parks, your early Hudnall Juniors. Um, and then you've got more of your, your newer photographers um, that, that are out there. I don't even want to start naming off names because there's too many to name. Um, I mean, female photographers that I follow, um, everybody inspires everybody. And I think as, as, a, as a Black photographer um, and what a lot of us say on, on Clubhouse apps and some of the apps that I'm on and some of the groups that I'm in is that we have to tell our narrative. We have to share our stories because if we don't share our stories, our story will be shared not the way that it is meant to be shared. And we understand our issues and we understand our concerns. So, you know, the influences of the likes of the Gordon Parks being that I'm in Kansas um, is a huge impact on the black photography community. Um, but there's so many others that are out there. Um, 
even even white photographers that you know have their own respective bodies of work that you know again luke and i my buddy we we study photo books all the time because again uh different photographers have different ways um the second part of the question was, you know, how does that impact, you know, way I edit? Typically, you know, when I'm doing documentary work, I, I typically, you know, focus more on black and white. Um, but again, I, I make the frame, I make the photograph in the camera um, and, and leave minimal editing to what I do in, in my post work. Um, but sometimes I don't know if it's going to be black and white. Uh, there's a passion project, another story that I've been working on for a year that I just wrapped up. And I will tell you 100% that I made that story. It was 10,000 plus pictures. I narrowed it down to 100. And then last night, I narrowed it down to 25. Um, and I started that project out in color. Um, and it wasn't until I got with Luke and I and, and, and Nick and a few other people um, and I decided that the project needed to be in black and white. So again, you, you make the photograph in the camera and you sit down and you figure out what you have in hopes that it uh, turns out to your liking, whether that's black and white or color. That's great. And well, just, I wanna <clears throat> say a couple of quick things to the audience. I don't, I'm not sure who these questions are coming from, but I do wanna say, a special hello and welcome to the students of Jennifer Ray, who is our um, photography faculty member in the School of Art, Design, and Creative Industries. So you do have a bunch of uh, uh, photography students in the audience, and I'm wondering if maybe the questions are coming from them. Um, I also want to let everybody in the audience know that uh, this talk is being recorded and it's going to be on our YouTube channel. I think in about a week. So if you want to ever reference back to it, it's going to be out there. Um, I guess last question, and then we should um, wrap up just because it's getting late. Um, have you done any follow up with the veterans you photographed? And I guess maybe a, a larger question about, you know, your practice as a documentarian, like, you know, how do you keep going, like with Yuma Street? How do you see those relationships evolving? Like what kind of sense of responsibility or connection do you feel to the stories that you take on in terms of telling them? Uh, that's a good question. There, uh, there is no way to follow up with homeless, homeless individuals or homeless veterans because again, you know, they're living on the streets. They don't have an email. Uh, I had a guy that I went to high school with that said, hey, if you can send some veterans my way, I can offer them a job. And I told him, I said, you have to think about this. And he, he, he didn't even think about it. You know, how do you contact them? They don't have phones. Uh, I think I've run across one individual that in Denver that had a prepaid phone. Um, and that prepaid phone was not for his use, but it was only for his use to communicate with his kids. Um, so again, you think about it, there's, there's no iPhone, there's no Androids, there's no FaceTime, there's no Venmo, you know, it's literally dollars and cents. Um, it's sleeping bags, it's under buildings, it's under awnings, it's wherever they can find a nook and a cranny to get in to sleep. Um, so there is no follow up to it. Um, it is literally documentation at its rawest form. Um, and as I travel, you know, I, I try to make connections through social media and, and try and put people in touch with individuals that I've come across. You know, once I come back, I, I use the tagging through social media to say this was in Manhattan, Kansas, or this was in Dallas, Texas, or wherever, and in hopes that people see these stories that are following my work and are able to help individuals or even start conversations themselves. So hopefully the work that I'm doing inspires other people to, you know, when you pass that next person, you ask that person, would you mind sharing your story of how you ended up here? And hopefully that leads to us all stepping out of our comfort zones to help people that are uh, less fortunate than us without going into it with uh, negative connotation or, you know, prejudging uh, individual based upon their circumstance. <laughs> Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, do you want to say a little bit about like the, the larger kind of question of other other stories that you've done and like Yuma, I know, I think you mentioned wanting to do a book about it and I, I guess I'm curious sort of how 
because you're such a wonderful storyteller and you were collecting all these stories. And I, I'm curious to hear you say just a little bit more about the relationship between the stories and the images and how you see that. Yeah, so Yuma Street, um, I'm at the point now where I've been documenting it, you know, through photographs and narratives and small audio files. And I'm working with local uh, organizations here in the Manhattan, Kansas area to uh, seek out funding uh, as I publish a book. Um, I would like to do everything local um, first to, you know, seek funding here locally and then uh, potentially publishing, but I don't think we are outfitted to produce a photo book. Um, we are able to produce like narrative books, but not a photo book, which requires special papers and printing and publishing. Um, so I'll probably have to go outside for that. But uh, the first start is to seek local funding. Um, if, if granted the opportunity, I will begin um, once approved. If not approved, then I will seek out uh, funding outside of here through uh, grant opportunities um, to create a book to share these stories of the Yuma Street uh, community. Um, again, you've, you've got a lot of history um, right here in my own backyard. Um, it's easy because it's right here. Um, sometimes with other projects, it's not as easy because it requires travel. Um, but uh, the goal of the Yuma Street project is to put it into a uh, uh, a physical physical form in a book. Um, the Homeless Veteran Project is on my website, but the end goal for that is to put his platform onto my nonprofit's website and uh, continue that project safely once the pandemic is uh, allows safe travel into these areas because from the little traveling that I did last year, uh, I learned that the population of homelessness has increased because of the pandemic and so many people have uh, been put out and been put into the street. So, you know, until things get to a safe standpoint, I won't be able to resume that. But, you know, the 75 veterans that I've come across, um, I've got those stories out there and they're on my website to read. And um, hopefully I can pick, resume that once, uh, once things are safe to resume normal travel. Yeah, it's such important work. Um, I just, I wanna, I, I think, I think yeah we've we've covered all of our questions and um I just want to say thank you again this was so wonderful to hear about your work um again I I have nothing but the deepest respect for it and um I'm sure our audience shares that sentiment so thank you and um I and others I'm sure we're looking forward to seeing the exhibition next year and following your work um and see you do great amazing things Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. <laughs> Hi. Hey, Dad. Thank you, Anna. I appreciate it. Good night, everybody. Good night.